Let me introduce our first performer today, uh, Mary Magic. It's a non-binary Chinese-American artist and researcher working within the intersections of body and gender politics and the ecological implications of capitalism. They are based in Vienna since 2019. Mary Magic frequently uses biohacking as a xenofeminist practice of care that serves to demystify invisible lines of molecular biopower. After completing their masters at MIT Media Lab in design fiction, their project Open Source Estrogen was awarded honorary mention at the Pre-Ars Electronica in 2017 in hybrid arts, and in 2019, they completed a 10-month Fulbright residency in Jakarta, Indonesia, investigating the relationship between Javanese mysticism and the plastic pollution crisis. Mary Magic is a recipient of the 2022 Night, uh, Night Art and Tech Fellowship, and their work has exhibited internationally, including Kunsthal Charlottenburg, Center for Contemporary Culture Barcelona, Philadelphia Museum of Art, the Science Gallery, and ICA London, um, as well as the Migros Museum of Contemporary Art in Zurich, the HKW and the Art Laboratory in Berlin, um, at the Jeux de Pomme in Paris, uh, Paris, as well as in the Jogja National Museum in Jakarta. They are a current member of the online network Hecteria, Open Source Biological Art, the Laboratory Theater Collective Aliens in Green, the Asian feminist collective Myling Vienna, as well as a contributor to the Radical Syllabus Project Pirate Care and to the Online Cyber Feminism Index. Um, so I, before I give the floor to Mary Magic, I would like to say that in the end of the performance or towards the middle of it, we will need some volunteers. Uh, we would like to, or sh um, they would like to collect some urine from um, some volunteers. So if you feel like donating or contributing, uh, please make sure to drink enough water. We have some more bottles. Um, and um, yeah, of course, before I give the floor to Mary, uh, we would also like to thank the Cervantes Institute and the Austrian Cultural Forum um, to, uh, for supporting this event and uh, for making it possible. And uh, Mary, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, so we need four participants to donate urine. So please, if you're interested, just drink some water and start to produce the urine. OK, so um, I always like to start the presentation with this slide of the astral world, because I'm going to slowly unpack what I mean by the astral world and why I created this fictional brand. Uh, but just to summarize it, we are all living in the astral world. And living in the astral world means living through this kind of double trauma. And what I mean by this double trauma is that, first of all, we live in a profoundly polluted world that is colonized by these hormonal molecules. So that's the first kind of trauma. The second trauma comes when we realize how trapped we are in this kind of colonial, patriarchal, heteronormative way of thinking that is both paralyzing and decollectivizing. So in this talk, uh, I'm gonna talk a lot about biohacking, but I'm gonna talk about how biohacking helped me to, it helped to reveal the astral world to me and it also helped me to find a way out. So this is separated into three sections. So part one, an existential knowing. I love this quote by Ian Hacking in the book, Representing and Intervening. We did not find sex hormones somewhere in the lost corner like a desert island lost in the mist. We ourselves called sex hormones into existence. So in 2015, when I first started researching on open source estrogen, one of the first things I did was I just typed in estrogen into the Google image search. So these are the results that I got. So as you can see, there's images of uh, femininity, smoother skin, larger breast size. There's also lots of pharmaceutical products, of pills that are promising, you know, like, uh, reproductive uh, control and also hormone replacement therapy. 
So from this screenshot of images, it really gave me a clear idea of what the public's relationship with hormones are, which is primarily facilitated through the pharmaceutical industry. And what also uh, got me really curious was how did we arrive at this black box fact that estrogen produces femininity and testosterone produces masculinity? So how did gender become codified by these biochemicals? And then the further on as I researched, I noticed that these hormonal molecules already exist all around us as a state of environmental toxicity. And I started to frame this as a kind of molecular colonization because it poses the question of, well, how do we decolonize our bodies, environments, and the planetary? So just to kind of uh, zoom in to the macro, I mean, to the micro scale. So the green molecule in the image represents the estrogen receptor. And scientists have called this receptor highly promiscuous which is a funny way to describe a receptor, but what they mean is that it's a lock that has many keys. So the estrogen receptor is supposed to bind to the, the natural estrogens that we produce in our bodies, but for whatever reason, um, all of these residues of late industrial capitalism also bind into the receptor and they cause these mutable effects. Another interesting thing about the receptor is that it is highly conserved among all animal taxa. So if you kind of think back to this like very ancient organism that first evolved a vertebrae, so from this original organism and all the different species that came out of this ancestral organism, we all share the same estrogen receptor. So this is like uh, a very huge shared species vulnerability that we have when it comes to these industrial molecules affecting our bodies. So there's many phrases to kind of describe this biohacking practice that I'm going to present, but the phrase that I like the most is public amateurism. And this is a phrase from Claire Pentecost, who is a writer and also an artist. And what she means is that public amateurism is the practice of learning and doing and failing in the public sphere and kind of removing the hierarchy of the layperson and the expert. So I think it's really important to note this type of knowledge production that's happening in these biohacking spaces and how inherently political that is when you are gaining and producing knowledge outside of these institutional spaces. So like imagine learning science in this like biohacking way versus like, you know, sitting in a lecture in a classroom at your university or your high school. So it's really like putting that knowledge into a different context, right? And that itself is inherently political. So one of the first protocols I was exploring was these yeast biosensors. So the basic principle of a sensor is that you have an input and an output. So in this case, the input would be an estrogenic molecule and the output would be some kind of color change. So in this case, these are biosensors because I'm basically using transgenic yeast. And what I've done to make them transgenic is that I've inserted the human estrogen receptor into it. So as a result, these yeast actually turn yellow in the presence of estrogen. So that lets me know that, you know, whatever is in here, you know, and if it's turning yellow, then I know there's something estrogenic in this bottle. And then the next protocol we explored was a solid phase extraction. So this is a protocol that's really important when you want to test a large dilute body of water sample. So like if you collect a water sample from the river or from, from drinking water or from the ocean, then you would need to perform this step to concentrate all the hormones into this C18 cartridge. And this is the DIY column chromatography, which I'm going to demo today. So um, I found this protocol to be really useful for urinary hormones. So what we're going to extract today is not going to be like just 
isolated estrogen, but it's actually going to be a whole collection of these steroidal molecules. So what I mean by that is all of these molecules that have this six ring carbon structure. The six ring carbon structure is what causes the molecule to be very fatty or very oily, so it can actually pass through the cell membrane. But at the same time, these hormonal molecules, they have these side chains that make them polar or dissolve in water. So that's why these industrial residues can also be carried through the water, through the air, through the food that we eat, um, and all of these invisible ways. And this is the result of the extraction. So what you see in the tube is this brown sticky substance. And I actually have some extracted hormones today. So later on, we can pass them around and do like a smell test because it's, it's pretty interesting. Um, so I usually get one out of three reactions from smelling the same sample. Uh, people will say like, oh, I don't smell anything at all. And other people will say, uh, oh, it smells really horrible, get it away from me. And then, and then lastly, people will say like, oh, it actually smells kind of sweet, like it smells like caramel or something. So um, I find this really interesting because it reminds me of how dogs react to each other when they're smelling each other's asses. Because what they're actually smelling is the hormones that are left behind from the urine and the feces. And that really, you know, that, that affects their behavior. So either they don't care at all, or they want to start like having sex, or they just start fighting each other. So I feel like the hormones, when they're outside of the body, they're actually pheromones. And they are activating something very like ancient and animalistic in our bodies. And then I adapted this urine hormone protocol into this fictional cooking show called Housewives Making Drugs. And this, is, this was a really fun project to film. I was working with two trans actresses in LA and we co-wrote the script together and they're basically showing the same protocol and um, framing it as like trans access to healthcare and also sharing the recipe with the audience at home. And at the end, we're all just like dancing with like the hormones and like drinking them through like a shot of vodka and, so it's just like a very like, uh, yeah, it's a very like subversive, also very joyful kind of um, 10 minute film. So uh, you can access this online. And then um, I was using these mobile labs to travel around the world and give these hormone hacking workshops. And then recently in the last couple of years or so, um, some museums contacted me to show the mobile labs as art objects. So I just think it's kind of funny like how, um, how this practice gets framed into like a museum context. And yeah, so the, the suitcase I have with me today is kind of my, um, my secondary suitcase because I don't have these right now. These are, these are actually in the Kunsthal Wolfsburg so they're on exhibition right now. And then this is like, like a collage of images of what the mess looks like during these hormone workshops. And I really like showing this collage of images because it's super messy, it's very cogenerative, and that's kind of how biology is in the real world. Like it's very messy and it's like you really don't know what's going to happen or, or emerge. So, um, it's really counter analogous to the white sterile space of the laboratory. And then if you think about what's also a white sterile space is the gallery or the museum. So I really like this kind of act of subversion. And this is a very long text, but I'm not gonna read everything, but um, I like to just point out that, you know, from all of this existential knowing that is produced from biohacking, um, it was, a, it took me two or three years after starting open source estrogen to write this six point plan. And um, I would say like, you know, step one, step two, and step three, you know, like it's very much like, fr like it's, we're really dealing with the socio material effects of hormone hacking like we're able to like really understand this 
um, this social material um, biopolitics that is really um, binding us all together. So the first three steps are really just like very tactical, very practical. But then we get into more like we go deeper and deeper. Like we're going into these deeper entrenched ideologies that, again, like one of these traps that we're living in under the astral world. And then finally, we get to number six, considering the microperformativity of the hormones as an agential power of collaboration. So this is kind of the step that I'm like most emphasizing right now in my workshops, because actually right now my workshops are more like performances and I'm going to explain why. So how to live, act, and care in a permanently polluted world. So after some time of doing these workshops, I was kind of, it felt like I wasn't really um, addressing this emotional affect of the participants. Because, you know, it's like we do all this hacking and then we realize like all these scandalous levels of estrogen in the water supply. And it's just kind of like, okay, now what? You know, like, what do we do now? So the workshop just kind of ends and we're just kind of like, okay, like, we only, like, yeah, we just learned some science, but it's like, you know, we didn't necessarily come up with um, a way to cope in this permanently polluted world. So that leads me to part two of this talk, alien tendencies I wish to no longer hide. So I came across this paper in 2016 and it was a really interesting paper because of the title. So they, the scientists were hybridizing these two species of fish and then they accidentally created a hermaphrodite species. And then they called the hermaphrodite species a hopeful monster in the title of the paper because the fish is actually able to self-reproduce when it's not able to find a mate because it has both ovaries and testicles. So um, nature is super, super queer. And it made me wonder why we can't see our bodies, which are also very queer, as being hopeful monsters, right? Because because you know, I look on the internet a lot and like I always come across these articles, like this one right here. Um, it's a blog post by some random person, and what they're saying is like, like, oh, I don't think it's right that the government allows birth control pills and the water supply because it's making all the men gay. And we need both men and women to propagate the human species. And maybe we should talk about this more than just like, you know, about people crossing our borders. And I thought like, whoa, like, so you have like homophobia and transphobia and xenophobia all in the same article. And this is like really like, uh, this is very problematic. Like, you know, it's, it's um, as a society and these kind of the ideologies of the extra world, like this is the trap that I'm talking about because we are experiencing all this, all of this pollution, but then there's also like, there's no way out of it, right? Because we're, we're trapped under this kind of toxic discourse. And then we have these medical practices. This is a um, very common practice in the US. So when a child is born in the hospital with ambiguous genitalia, the doctors will actually perform a surgery to make the child male or female. So, this illustration I really love. It's from the book Sexing the Body, which I really recommend reading. So, you know, if you think about it, it's just based on these arbitrary numbers, right? These measurements that say like, okay, like the clitoris is between 0.5 and one centimeters. Penis should be between 2.5 and 4.5 centimeters. And like anything in between is intersex and we need to alter or correct the genitalia. So, so as a society, we have this medically accepted practice and like this medically accepted definition of normal and natural. So for me, it's like, who is determining these definitions? Who's determining these taxonomies? And can we find a way out? Like, can we actually modify this? Because our bodies are certainly changing faster than society can really comprehend. And then thus comes the fear, the panic, the shame, et cetera, et cetera the decollectivization. So um, I, I really like this image. 
uh, it's it's really interesting to me because when we're talking about strategies, right? This is kind of the dominant strategy. It's just like let's clean up, or like let's just like barricade the pollution like out of sight. Like let's like flush it down the toilet. Let's just like round up the plastic and like move it somewhere else, right? So this is the dominant strategy and. For me, it's really problematic. I'm really critical of these kind of like purity politics where it's like we need to return nature back to its pristine form. But, you know, we don't realize that nature itself is a human construct. We created this ontological separation between nature and culture and humans and animals. And that has led to all of these uh, extractivist practices to uh, sexism, racism, like it's, it's all rooted in, again, like the purity politics of the extra world, these purity ideologies. So can we create a strategy that's not just mirroring this image? So I, I started to explore this kind of more um, performance-based and like uh, embodied approach to biohacking when I started collaborating with this tactical theater group called the Aliens in Green. So the Aliens in Green, they're kind of like, um, they identify themselves as this contra-analogous entity to the men in black, you know, these Hollywood fictional characters that go around erasing people's memories when they see aliens. So the Aliens in Green are, are um, the opposite of that. We're actually trying to show how the whole planet is just one big laboratory. So we do all these um, highly orchestrated um, six hour, eight hour, sometimes 10 hour long performances with 25 participants. And then we make them do, do a bunch of these exercises and not all of them make sense. And we give very little instructions. And we, we just have them do a bunch of like labor and tasks, and they have no idea why they're doing it. And um, it seems really confusing at first, but we're doing that intentionally to create this kind of crisis of the body. And this crisis is really reflected in how we're approaching this endocrine disruption or this toxicity or this pollution. Is like we always, like the first thing is always this crisis of the body. And then slowly, you know, after like many hours, you know, going through the performance and going through all the actions, then, you know, we're trying to bring them to this point of neutrality. You know, we're like neutralizing that crisis. And then from this point of neutrality, that's kind of when, you know, we can start to get new subjectivities to emerge. And that's the point that we're trying to bring everyone to. And so I started to adapt some of these tactics into my own personal projects. So in the Molecular Queering Agency, this is a performance that we're kind of gonna mimic today. So um, we're going to worship our urine. So the urine to me represents this um, evidence of our disobedient bodies. Because when you start investigating the urine, you find like all of these you know, organic, natural hormones, like you find stress hormones, you find like caffeine, you find all these things, but then you also find microplastics and like all of these synthetic things that really prove like how multiply composed we are, and like how porous we are, right? Like stuff is like coming in and out of our bodies like all the time. So it's like, it really goes against this, this fixity that the estrogen world is trying to sell to us, right? This like fixity and like this fantasy that we can just barricade ourselves from the outside world. So in this performance, it was actually readapted uh, in 2021 to be um, this 10 person trauma releasing ritual. So in this video, um, in this performance, I'm actually guiding all the participants like through this um, through a series of choreographed uh, body movements and gestures that are meant to kind of increase your somatic awareness about the toxicities all around us. Um, I started to think about how microplastics that are trapped in our bodies can also act as, you know, 
trauma that's stored in our bodies because our bodies all have this memory of like every trauma that took place from the moment we started gestating in our mother's womb. If you look into kinesiology and all these other body healing practices, you'll know that like there's a memory in the body that is very, um, it's very subconscious. The mind is not always aware of it. And so this, this performance is kind of like trying to um, bring that awareness back. And, um, but it's also like kind of a strange, like it's, it's a very strange, um, it's a really strange experience for everyone because I don't give any instructions. I just say like, follow my lead and everyone just has to copy my strange body movements and they have no idea what's about to happen. Um, but that's kind of the point because I'm leading them into this space of unknowingness. And it's really similar to the, sa the same space or this, the, the same headspace when we are just realizing how polluted this planet is. We're just like, okay, so I don't know what's gonna happen after this. I don't know what's gonna happen to my body. I don't know what's gonna happen to my kid's body or my kid's kid's body. So it's like this space of unknowingness. And yeah, and then we're worshiping the urine. And uh, I have to say that these uh, uniforms that I constructed, they're actually um, partly uh, stuff that you can buy on AliExpress. And it's like promising like um, anti-UV radiation and like antibacterial properties. And we're kind of playing with this idea of like, oh, like let's just like um, cover ourselves and protect ourselves from the outside world. So that's why we're wearing these strange uniforms. And um, also we wear these oxygen masks, which I brought here today. Um, the masks, they contain hormones that have been extracted from previous performances. And when we put on the masks, we're essentially saying yes to, to inhaling these foreign molecules. And I think it's really interesting to say yes to this because you're, you're actually giving consent. And if you think about it, none of us are really given consent or giving consent to live in this toxic world. We're just kind of born into it and then we need to find a way out. So I find that this act of, of allowing consent is actually kind of, it's kind of healing. And this right here is a three-step process for living in an increasingly queer world. So I kind of see this as like my artist toolkit. Like it's like the, um, it's like this outline that I refer back to for everything that I do, um, for all of my workshops, for all of my performances. And even this talk that I'm giving to you right now is like based off of this outline. Like, you know, I started in the beginning, like talking about how polluted the planet is and how we're all like colonized. And then step two is semiosis. You're already alien. You know, you have microplastics in your blood and in your urine, you're multiply composed. And then step three is, you know, when you've reached the point of neutrality and it's like, okay, do you want to be more alien than you already are? So like the consent is given, the choice is given. And so that leads me to part three of this talk, the genesis of caressing oceans. So this is a very new workshop performance format that I've been exploring since this year. So um, back in April of this year, we did this performance in Lisbon in Portugal. And what we did was we first arrived in this kind of um, like a toxic site where, you know, toxicities have leaked across bodies and space and time. Um, it's, a, it's a site of ecological ruin. And then we start to scavenge for materials. We're scavenging for these materials that have been deliberately alienated. And what I mean by that is if you read Heather Davies and her book, Plastic Matter, she describes this really well, you know, about um, plastic being this deliberately alienated material because it's like intentionally dissociated and dislocated. 
So these are very much like colonial logics, right? Like you, these materials, you have no idea like where they came from, right? They're just like in this sterile and uh, clean packaging or, and you just, you have no idea where that origin is. It's like literally non-localized. So we're like looking for these types of materials, these very alien materials, and then we bring them back to this venue. So we bring all the materials back into this large pile, and then we put on these blindfolds. And we do this kind of, um, I call it a non-ocular sensing exercise or like a blind sensing exercise. And we do this for about 20 minutes, 30 minutes or 45 minutes. And we're basically, we're giving up this ocular centrism because this is kind of what has um, contributed to most of, you know, our Western cosmologies about matter and mattering. So what I mean by that is, um, if you think about the God trick, you know, the way Donna Haraway describes it, you know, you believe it when you see it and how we're limited by our scientific tools for really seeing the world, then this exercise is meant to kind of, you know, use hearing as a form of touching, as a form of tasting, you know, as a form of smelling, as a form of seeing. So that's the whole point of this exercise, to really allow this intimacy to spill over into the non-human or into the extra human. And then lastly, we do a scenography building. So this is where, um, this is the point where I believe biohacking goes from an existential knowing into a kind of worlding. And this is what we're doing here in the scenography building. Like we're actually trying to world out of these alienated materials because we've gained that intimacy and now we're ready to construct the world that we want to see. So here like everyone's constructing and the only rule in this exercise is that you're not allowed to speak. So all of your negotiations and all of your decision-making has to be done without language. And it's really interesting what emerges because it's kind of a, a mix between a shelter and a garden and a shrine. And these are all, I think, elements of what symbolizes a home, right? A sense of belonging. And that's really, um, that's really what we're trying to do, right? We're trying to see the alien in us and thus like we belong in this astral world. We're trying to make the astral world our astral world. That's the whole point of this. And then I did this performance again in the Rupert residency in Vilnius in Lithuania. And we did it uh, with the students that are part of the program. And we actually did it in this abandoned sewing factory. And so there are tons of materials to scavenge. And there's like the whole building is just covered in a layer of dust, you know, like kind of like these ghosts of like a, a kind of a industry that collapsed, you know. And um, so we did this performance and um, yeah, I should also add that after we build the scenography, we actually perform in the scenography. So I always try to arrange like a kind of public event, like where there's actually an audience that's watching the, the performance in the new scenography. And I think it's like, um, it's, you know, when you're, you're, when you're being observed, you know, and you're performing in the space, like there's just this added element of, um, yeah, like this kind of, um, it adds to this uh, worlding exercise when you're um, acting in the space and then you're kind of um, figuring out like your relationship to that space, to the other, you know, it's kind of like almost like a identity forming exercise. So that's the scenography after we finish the performance. And we also do the urine hormone extraction uh, in the scenography. So it's kind of hard to see, but um, the participants have basically built in the, um, the extraction tools like into the scenography. So during the performance, we're actually like doing this ritual of like pouring the urine and kind of worshiping it and extracting the hormones as a way to kind of investigate this new world that we've constructed. So, 
that's actually the end of this talk. So um, I will now switch over to the biohacking demo. And uh, please, if anyone's ready to produce urine, um, just uh, you can get a glass there and then you can go to the toilets in the back and then we can start doing the demo. Uh, Anyone else? We need two more people. I'm just going to randomly pick people. <laughs> well, you don't have to um, give all of your pee. <laughs> you can just hold on to it for set up the column chromatography. So column chromatography is a really basic chemistry protocol that is for separating the compounds that you're interested in. So normally in the laboratory, they have these like very beautiful, expensive glassware for doing this experiment. But uh, because we are DIY biohackers, I actually created this from a bottle of schnapps, and I just uh, cut the bottom off. So it's very easy to produce something like this. So the first thing I'm going to do is actually cover the top here. So to do that, I'm going to use something called parafilm. This is actually something you find in the laboratory, but um, if you don't have parafilm, you can just use some plastic wrap. actually stretch this quite a lot, like this, and then the other side, and then you just wrap it on top to close it, and it's going to stick to itself, so you should hear something like that, and then I'm going to take um, a sharp object like this, and I'm just going to make a hole at the top. But I'm not going to make it too big because I don't want the contents to fall out of the bottle. Okay, so now that's ready. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put a layer of cigarette filters. So I talked earlier about the kind of uh, the chemical properties of hormones. So they have this like kind of greasy, oily side that's non-polar, but then they also have this polar side, right? So they have this dual prop property. So the cigarette filters, we kind of just discovered by accident because we were smokers, and we, um, we had trouble finding these um, really fancy laboratory filters, and so we thought like, okay, let's try the cigarette filters. And then we found out that cigarette filters are actually a very non-polar material. So to test this out, you can just take some acetone, which is like nail polish remover, and you just put some drops of nail polish remover on these cigarette filters, and then the filters will actually melt. So that's how you know that this, the, the chemical properties of this is actually very non-polar, because it's melting in this alcoholic substance. So after I have this layer, the second layer I'm going to put is a layer of silica gel. Silica gel you probably have seen in your packets of electronics or like a bag of chips or something. And so what they're doing is actually absorbing moisture from the air. So um, since it's absorbing moisture, that means it's very polar, like it's very like water absorbing. So this is gonna be the polar part of the column.
papers away. So I just basically explained um, how to prepare this column. It's very simple, just a layer of cigarette filters and then silica gel. So the first thing we're going to do to activate the column is just to pour water through it. This is called a conditioning step. Um, this all looks kind of strange and everything, but I want you to imagine that we're just in a kitchen. Because what we're doing now is like just, you know, kitchen chemistry, like there's nothing really fancy about it. You know, we're all just cooking in the kitchen. So the first thing I'm gonna do is just pour water. And you can see like some smoke is coming out. It's not really smoke, it's actually um, the silica gel is reacting to the water because it's getting oversaturated and it's causing the bubbles, I mean, uh, it's causing the, the beads kind of pop and that's why there's this, um, this kind of smoke coming out. So after that's all drained out, the next step is the urine. So I think we should all like synchronize this and like kind of like ritualize this because it's a very like witchcrafty moment. So I suggest that we all come around the magical column and, and if you consent, then let's all put on the oxygen masks. And as I explained earlier, there are hormones uh, in the bottom of the tube. Uh, you might be able to smell it, you might not. Um, it's not super strong at this point. But yeah, let's, if you consent, let's put this on.
column has the column has become pink, so it has feminized. I'm just joking. Uh, it's it's the the type of silica that I bought is is intentionally uh, going from blue to pink. So um, now that we've done this step of the urine, I'm just going to wait a little bit for all of the urine to come out. So at this point, we can assume that all the hormones have been trapped inside the column because they are attracted to the chemical properties of the silica gel and the cigarette filters. So everything in this bowl right here is technically like just waste, like there's, there's no more hormones inside, theoretically. So to get the hormones off of the column, I'm going to use something called methanol. So you've probably heard of this um, alcohol before. It's, um, it's quite dangerous. Like if you actually drink it, you can actually go blind. So it's really careful, like it looks like water, you know, so don't mistake it for water and don't drink it. So in all of the scientific papers that I read, uh, the hormones really like to be dissolved in methanol. So, we're going to put methanol through the column and then we're going to catch everything in one of these tubes. I actually have an example here. So this is, um, these are my hormones uh, dissolved in methanol. And when we get to this last step, usually you would you put this in a pot of boiling water and this will help to evaporate the methanol. And then once all the methanol is evaporated, then you have only that brown sticky stuff at the bottom of the tube, which is your hormones. So we're gonna get to this last step here and then um, unfortunately there's no time to do the boiling and to get the hormones. But um, what we can do is Maybe all of you can just like take the tube off. Can you are you able to take the tube off of the the mask? Yeah, so just go ahead and smell it a bit and I think we should pass it around with the audience too so you guys can also experience the hormones. So do you wanna describe what you smell? I'm not sure it's the urine from the For me, it's my like chicken milk. Really? Maybe it's the urine item. <laughs> Faint, sweet smell, kind of like sugar. I don't know, I don't know. It's really faint, actually. Uh, faint, just smell it. What about you? Mine you actually it? smells like uh, public water. Okay, <laughs> so um, maybe you can uh, switch the samples and see if you <coughs> smell something similar. <coughs> so do you agree with the same sample or are you smell something different? <coughs> So this is a very special sample here because we have five different urine samples mixed in here. So um, this is basically the last step of the protocol. So as you can see, like we only performed three or four steps. So this is a very simple protocol. So I'm just gonna allow that to drain and maybe you want to give the samples also to the 
audience. And if anyone has questions, like please, like I'm happy to take them right now. And uh, let's also clap for our participants.